Okay, so in this first set of videos, we've talked about um, how to write descriptions for questions, how to set up questions um, that have a couple of sort of common limitations. So first of all, the questions that we've been looking at have primarily been method-based questions, where students are expected to write a method rather than a class, right? Java is an object-oriented language, and you know, being able to write and test classes is really important. There are features for doing that, and I'll get started in recording some videos to show you how to do that. Not necessarily going to get all the way there, um, but I will. I will eventually, right? But I want to sort of get there eventually. I'm just giving you a sense of kind of where the where we are and what the limitations are uh, so far. The other thing that we've also um, the other significant limitation that we've been dealing with so far is that there's only certain types of data that our tool knows how to work with, right? Um, we do do our best to try to be able to generate lots and lots of things where we can do so in a sort of a sane way, right? So for example, all the primitive types are supported. We can generate parameters for those. We can generate strings. We can generate collections like arrays. We can generate uh, lists. We can generate maps as long as the contents of the list, the key values in the map, uh, the contents of the array are things that we know how to generate. So we can generate arrays of strings. We can generate maps from strings to integers, things like this, right? So there are a lot of problems that you can just set up and rely on those automatic generation capabilities to give you a lot of nice random inputs for those types of things. However, once you start using custom classes, right, um, or custom objects that aren't, you know, known by our testing tool, you'll need some tools for being able to set those up and generate those inputs as well. So to start with, I figured let's do a simple class design problem, right? Um, just to give you a sense of how that works. It's not that different than what we've been doing so far, right? In fact, it's quite similar. Um, okay, so the testing process is a little bit different, right? Uh, so let's create a, a package called a counter object, okay? Um, and now, you know, rather than in the past, we could sort of create every class was called question because students never actually even wrote the question definition. So I was like, who cares, right? Um, in this case, we're going to write a, uh, we'll, we'll write a question called counter, uh, okay? Uh, because students are actually going to be expected to write this. And this is a counter object, right? And the idea behind the counter object, um, and, and let's write the description for it, okay? So, and uh, it says... Um, define and implement a public, I like to use class counter. Uh, counter should provide a single public constructor, constructor that, um, that accepts an int parameter. Uh, and, and, you know, for, for objects, a lot of times, the descriptions are longer than they are for methods. There's just more to say, right? There's more methods to describe and, and internal state that you might need to, to, to describe as well, right? Um, and then we'll say it should also provide an increment and decrement method. It, it should provide increment and decrement methods. Um, increment should increase the stored count while decrement should decrease it, um, both taking no parameters and returning void, and returning void. Uh, okay, and then uh, finally provide a get count uh, method that returns the stored count. Uh, or stored value, right? Um, right? Um, and, and maybe, you know, you, you could, there's, there's variations to this. You could have a counter that only goes up, right? You, you could have a counter where increment increases the value and returns the new value. So there's a bunch of different uh, things here. Um, sometimes, I, I will be honest, sometimes with uh, the class declaration, it's actually easier to de declare the class first, sometimes, or, or, or implement the class first. Sometimes I just put like a little placeholder uh, description in there, and then I get going on the, the implementation. And once I actually have something working and I'm happy with, then I go back and, and write the description. That's totally fine. Just don't forget, right? Um, okay, so this time we have a description, right? So we actually need to, to create something that implements that, right? Um, so I'll create um, a public constructor counter. Um, 
and we'll call this set value. Now, you know, one of the things that I frequently don't do when I'm setting up class design problems is tell students about private state. That's their job, right? Like, I'll tell you what's supposed to happen, and you need to figure out, and part of the fun of designing classes is to figure out what sort of data needs to be stored internally. All right, so we'll say uh, private uh, int value. Uh, we'll have the counter set value is equal to set value. Then I have a uh, public void increment method. I do value plus plus. Uh, then public void decrement method value minus minus. And then I'll say I get value method. And this is something that should just kind of generate for me. Perfect. Uh, okay, reformat things and, and we're good. Um, now, this is, uh, oh, I've got to put my correct annotation. Okay. Got so excited. Uh, counter. Oh, and it's going to break this again. So that is, uh, why does it do this? No. Okay. Yeah, that's another reason to declare. <laughs> that's another reason to declare your class first before you start in the description is that you'll actually be able to get the description into the right place more easily. Um, all right, I put an author on here and then I put a version. Uh, what's today? It's the sixth. Okay. It's, it's June. Okay, again, the last number is a counter. It's not the date. That's it. That should be all that we have to do. Let's try it. Right? Let's try validating this and see what happens. Uh, so uh, I'll focus this question for a minute. Uh, focus equals true. And then we'll hit test focused. And off we go. Let's see what happens. Now, let's talk a little bit about what happens when we validate objects. Uh, on some level, it's not that different, right? We try to, oh, and I forgot to turn off print, so I'm sorry, I did this last time too. Let's turn off the focus on this uh, so that we're just testing our counter object. Um, at some level, again, like this is pretty much the same process that we use for methods. The only difference, there's only two differences, right? First of all, we're testing objects, so we have to call the constructor. So the constructor gets called first. And, the construct, and what we do actually is we create a bunch of objects, right? That's the other thing that's different with methods. With a static method or with any method that the testing suite can determine is static, like I said, it might not be marked as static, but if the class has no private or public state, doesn't have any variables or it doesn't, and it has an empty constructor, then we usually assume that we can test that method like it's static, meaning we still create, a, we create an instance of an object but we don't create that many. We create one object and we just run that method over and over again, right? Because it's essentially static, okay? When I test objects, the tool will actually create a bunch of objects, right? Um, and then it tests them. And, and basically you can imagine, here's how the testing process goes. Um, the first pass is I have to create the objects. So if there's more than one con constructor, I pick one at random, I generate some random parameters for it, and I create the object with those parameters. Right? And I do this a bunch of times until I have the number of objects that I want to create. That might be like 30, right? Then, now I've got all these objects lying around. They've got methods, and I call those methods over and over again. Now, for the purposes of our testing suite, we distinguish between two types of methods. There are methods that uh, return something that allows us to observe the class, right? Which is essentially not void. If the class returns <laughs> if the method returns either void or a new instance, then that doesn't really help us observe what happened in that class, right? And so, uh, but we call the methods. If the method returns a value that we can compare with the solution, we do that, right? In order to make sure that the solution class and the submission class should behave identically, we always call the same methods in the same order with the same arguments on both the solution and the submission. So that starts with a constructor. So imagine in this case, we might create a solution and a submission pair where we called the constructor with 10. And then we called increment on both. And then we called increment again on both. And then we called get value on both. And then we called decrement on both. And then get value on both. And then increment, decrement. This is at random, right? And the whole time, anytime a method returns a value, we expect the solution and the submission to return identical values. If they don't, we stop testing and we say we found a problem. Okay, let's look at the report. This will make things a little bit more clear about what happened, right? Um, okay, so we're going over here. Um, so, so again, if we remove the plus, right, um, you'll see, oh, sorry, this is the wrong report. This is for print sum. I'm like, that doesn't look right. Here we go. Okay, right? So again, here's one incorrect example. 
Uh, this is where we changed get value to return zero, right? In this case, we just again removed a method. Uh, in this case, we changed a, a plus plus to a minus, a minus minus to a plus plus. We also just returned statement. So this is a void method. And so I can just go boom, just take the whole thing out. Now decrement does nothing, right? And so actually there were uh, eight different ways that we found to mutate this. And in every case, we found an example that failed. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that it's not always exactly clear where the failure happened, right? So let's think about increment, right? If I remove increment, let's say I take increment instead of doing plus plus, it just does nothing, okay? Because it returns void, I don't know immediately whether it worked or not, right? So it's actually not until I get to get value that the testing harness will know that something is wrong, right? So I, I start off with two counters, I initialize them to both to eight, then I call increment on both. One of them is now nine, the other one's broken, it's still eight. Now I call get value, right? At some point later, I'll call get value. And the idea is at that point, get value will be broken, right? Um, and so we're gonna improve this. This is something that students have asked about and sometimes it causes them to scratch their heads a little bit. Um, eventually the output here will be more useful and it actually show you the chain of operations, right? I haven't quite got there yet, but eventually what we'll do is we'll say, here's the sequence of operations that brought us to this bad place, right? So it's like I created it, I called increment twice, and then I called get value, and instead of it being, you know, if I created it with eight, instead of get value returning 10, it returned to eight, right? So something's wrong, right? So we'll do a better job of explaining this to the students eventually, but that's what's happening, right? Um, essentially, in every step, we pick a random object, we pick a random method, we call the method, we compare the results, if there are something to compare, um, and then, you know, uh, we see if we can find a failure. Okay, um, now we're done, right? I mean, God, I love not writing test suites, right? Isn't it great? It also allows us to test stuff like this because, you know, um, you know, tools like Coding Man are awesome, right? But they have this limitation, which is they can't really easily test things like this because a lot of their test cases are like based on strings, right? It's like, you know, a, a single line, like input, output, right? But here, because we're testing objects, we actually need to be able to test things that maintain state. And our testing tool is actually very good at this. Um, or it's equally good at this, right? This doesn't have that limitation. Um, let me show you something that can go wrong. All right, so let's imagine that I don't have a get value method, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm gonna run this again. And you'll see this time it's going to fail. And the reason it's gonna fail, it's not actually not even gonna, uh, yeah, so there's this error from the Genesol testing library. I don't know what's going on here. I'll just, yeah, there's some problem here. This is a weird error. I'm gonna hit uh, clear all, awesome. So there's a problem here in the Genesol testing library, which is that what it says is no way to verify generated receivers. And this might seem a little confusing, but here's the idea. I create two instances of counter, and then all I have are void methods. So there's nothing that returns a value that allows me to compare the two, right? And when that's the case, I can't test things, right? Again, it's like I can call increment and decrement all I want, but I don't know what that internal state is, okay? Uh, let me point out something else. That kind of leads us to another observation about our testing tool. We do not try to inspect internal state, okay? We don't try to inspect the values of anything marked as private. That's both on the solution and on the uh, and on um, submissions, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this. One is that, for example, like students might, so for example, like you could, uh, you could do this differently, right? So another way of solving this problem might be to save the initial value and then save a delta and then have get value combine the two together, right? That's fine, that'll work, right? I don't care. I think it's a little weird, but you know, if that's how it makes sense to you, then you go. So we don't look at private state. We don't look at private names, we don't look at private variables, it's just gone, right? The only thing we test is the public API for that class, right? Private variables are not part of the public API. Private methods are not public, part of the public API. And so you should note that if you mark a method as private, it will not be included in testing. It can be helpful to have private helper methods and your solution might have those and you might suggest to solution, to, uh, solution writers, to students, that they also use a private helper, but it will not be tested. If you want a method to be directly tested, you gotta mark it as public or package private, right? Um, okay, uh, let's put this, oh, no, there we go. Let's put this back in here so we can test. Yeah, I know, I know you're struggling. 
not exactly sure how to fix this problem. It might bite you too. It has to do with the report HTML not existing or something like this and, and something getting wonky. Um, so now I think things are happy again. Okay, good. Okay, so, so that's a, a simple example of a class design uh, problem that you can write uh, using our, our question tool.